Makes you want to take a ride with the top down, doesn't it? It's just that kind of song. How are you guys doing? Welcome. Welcome to week three of, I think it's our third week of Storytellers. This is Storytellers 2. This is going by fast. Uh, I'm playing the role of Scott Lowmaster this morning. I know you can tell by the spiky hair and the stunning good looks. Um, but uh, he, and, he and Lisa got to officiate uh, one of their uh, nephew's weddings this weekend. Um, so uh, um, down in Maryland, I think. So, uh, so they're, they're still winging their way back, uh, back from the Baltimore area. So we wish them well. Um, I want to pray in just a second, but I want to introduce first uh, some amazing people. Say, I see amazing people. Yeah, we got Jerry Flewelling up here, Malin Dieterle, and Stephanie Legidal. Come on, give, give these guys a hand. Yeah. Yeah. Because listen, so, some of y'all out there, you know, you're like, I'm so glad it's not me. Okay, so I know who's out there. So uh, I just want to, I want to pray this morning, and then we're just going to get into hearing some stories and, and just seeing, seeing what God does uh, through our stories and our testimonies this morning. And, and, uh, and uh, Alden had a word just a few minutes ago that she felt like um, the Lord is really going to break off shame off of people's lives this morning. So this, that's just awesome. Isn't that great? Um, isn't it great when, when the Lord gets to break off what it says in the word he despised? There's not a lot of things. You'll see a lot of things in the Old Testament where it says he hated something, but there's the, the one thing that really stands out in Hebrews 12, it says that he despised was the shame. And so he wants to break that, that off of us. So uh, Holy Spirit, we've already sensed your presence this morning and, and just the, the whirlwind uh, of who you are and what it is that you want to do in our lives. So we just welcome you. And, uh, and we would ask that you would just uh, allow our stories to drip with anointing this morning because it's your anointing that breaks, uh, that breaks yokes, breaks chains, breaks, uh, breaks everything of bondage and slavery off of our lives uh, and releases us into new places of freedom, freedom to live, freedom to feel like we're breathing for the first time again. In Jesus' name, everybody said, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Yay. I'm not sure who I want to start with this morning, so I'll talk, and then we'll, then we'll see who we're going to start with. Um, how many of you here were, for, here, for, here for, 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 for week two last week got to hear Scott on the power of vulnerability? Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. If you don't know, because uh, I, I asked Scott when I knew he was going to start working on the vulnerability talk, I said, have you looked up Brene Brown? And he said, yes, I've been listening to her stuff nonstop. If you don't know who that is, uh, look up, uh, just go to TED Talks online. Uh, and look up Brene, B-R-E-N-E, -E, and she is a rock star on this subject. Uh, just amazing, and she's just taken years and years of, of research and distilled it down into language any, any of us can really understand and say, yes, that's something I need to understand. So I want to encourage you, if, if last week was powerful for you, follow up. Of course, you can always go to journey-center.com to, um, to hear any of our messages. But if you want to um, go a little deeper with those things, start there. She's written books as well. She's, just, she's the authority on the subject right now. Um, she talked about a concept uh, of courage, and that coming from the, um, the Latin root, uh, but the French word initially meaning um, to tell your story with your whole heart to tell your story with your whole heart. And so we've got three amazing people uh, who are going to tell us some of their story with their whole heart because that's just how they live. They live wholehearted um, as we learned about. And we learned about the power of our story bringing freedom. Uh, and I um, want to remind you, you're, you're actually seeing representations of our leadership in this house on this stage. And it's very, very easy to look at leaders in our lives and say, oh, life must just be easier for them because they're leaders. Or, um, or God has just, you know, really just paved the way for a much easier life. Let's just laugh at that lie. <laughs> uh, but instead, you'll find that uh, most leaders, uh, if they've been around for a hot minute, are walking with a limp. Uh, that there's, there's a, rec uh, a recognition that the, the further you go in Christ, the, the more you're going to come up against challenges. I mean, how many of you hate that scripture when Jesus said, uh, in this life, you will have troubles. But don't you wish you could black that one out? You know, you want to redact that one out of Scripture. Be like, did you have to say that? And then he said, in this life, you will have trials. But he said, take heart. I've overcome the world. So we've got some stories represented this morning that are going to talk a little bit about how that's happened. So, Maylin, I'm just feeling you're going you're gonna to kind of start us off this morning. 
and, uh, and, and just begin to take us somewhere. So, and we have a mic all set up for you. So launch in wherever. We're just going to be messy and just start with your story. Oh, you're not going to guide me in a question first? <laughs> I could, but your story is stunning. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna let you start. Okay, well, let's just start with the most impacting one. <laughs> my husband died a year and a half ago. Um, two years ago, I lost my job, and they placed me in a position that I have find, found to be very much a challenge. Just recently, uh, a month ago, I lost my dad. Um, and then in between that, um, the house fell apart, and all the major um, financial things that would go wrong, like septic and all of that type of stuff, the high ticket items, they all decided to go to. So, ah, <laughs> it has been a trial. It's been um, a new awakening for me. <clears throat> in this, I, um, you know, for 33 years, I found my identity in being a wife. And um, though ups and downs, I really did cherish that. That's where I found myself. That's who I was. And now that um, my husband's gone and I'm trying to learn it all on my own, I'm trying to find my new identity and be a Mrs. Jesus, which <laughs> really, it sounds quirky, but seriously, it's not because it's for all of us. We're all Mr. and Mrs. Jesuses. Um, but now it's a new reality for me, and I don't have that person to lean on to to go to when I'm having a struggle. Um, so it forces me to have to get before Father and to search out the deeper things that are within and um, Him, vertical and horizontal. Um, so, yeah, this has been my new walk in life, um, going through transition, trying to figure out who I am and the next step and direction in my life. Wow. Actually, hold on to that for a second. I, I felt like you said a couple of really strong things in there that we could really um, just pull on a little bit further. You talked about that you had pulled a lot of your identity from being a wife or being specifically your husband's wife. And I just wonder, you know, is there, is there advice you can kind of give out of that journey for us that are spouses? Because I, I think that can be true of any spouse uh, even even in some of the hardest or most struggling relationships, to still, that's your crutch rather than running to the Lord. So what kind of, uh, is there any kind of advice that you would give in that respect to maybe kind of stem that earlier and just kind of begin to build that habit of, you know, running to the Lord as our refuge? Right. Well, I learned a lot of things being a wife. I've um, reflected, and when I see myself as a child, I wasn't one that really liked authority and um, if, it, if something didn't apply to myself and I thought it was stupid, I would rebel against it. So, um, Not that any of you have ever had that issue in your life ever, ever, but continue. So being um, a wife of a godly man who was raised up in a Christian home, I learned what it was like to come under authority. And not with a strong gavel, but with a man who loved me with all of his heart, who adored me and would lay his life down for me like he was supposed to as Christ laid his life down for the church. And that's, that's the quality that I found in my husband. Um, so I learned what it was like to um, come under the headship of a husband. And um, I learned obedience in that. I learned how to be graceful. And I learned how to love because when him and I would come against each other when I didn't agree with him um, and I would listen to Holy Spirit, I also learned what it was like to love that authority figure that would rub against me at some points in my life. So um, now I have to learn that new authority in the Lord. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite preachers uh, says that marriage is a death march to a life camp. How many of you know when you got married, you thought everything was going to be hunky-dory, and then your dory got hunky? Because there's an element about this that as we're becoming one, and as we're moving towards each other, stuff has to die. Stuff actually has to fall off. You don't get, you don't get to hold on to all your quirks. You don't get to leave your underwear on the floor, you know, for, for, for weeks on end. I'm talking to guys. I know none of the women in here do that. Uh, but there's a... There's an element about this that I really feel that um, 
that Maylin is hitting on. Um, from Ephesians 5, it says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Most of us miss that verse because there's usually a, a topical heading that comes next. This is marriage like Christ in the church, or sometimes it says, you know, wives submit to your husbands. But it says first, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Say one another. That's important because then what follows is, is framed inside of that. It goes on to say, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Now, if you stopped there, that'd be another one you'd probably want to redact out of scripture, but keep going. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's easier to submit to somebody who's dead. Oh, oh, let me read that again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ being the picture of laying down his life for us. How many of you know it's much easier to submit yourself to somebody who's really died to themselves? Wow, this is going over really well this morning. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm just going to spend a little bit more time here before we go on with our stories. So what Scripture is saying here is, apart from presenting really a mysterious picture of who Christ is in relationship to his bride, is he's presenting a picture of, listen, saying, ladies, submit to your husbands. Husbands, die. Die to yourselves, die to your selfish desires, because it, it goes on to talk about, uh, so husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Like, you don't, you don't hate your body, you actually nourish, nourish it, you, you, you feed it. And so it's really important for us when we're, um, when we're talking about things like submission, which often goes off kind of like it did a few, a few minutes ago, uh, in a church setting, we got to talk about a relationship that is defined of the fact that when I came to this marriage, I came to die. I came to lay down my life so that you would live, so that your dreams would be fulfilled. We've got it backwards in the church for, for probably for centuries that, that has said that uh, pastors sitting down with wives to be and saying, hey, when you get married, okay, your life is about him now. And scripture, Paul's actually saying, no, no, no. When you get married, you die. And this is about you coming to a relationship. And so I'm saying, I'm here for what I can give, not for what I can get. And so I'm going to submit my life into this. I'm going to die to myself because I want to see your dreams fulfilled. I want to I see everything that God has for you fulfilled in your life. Even if you don't agree, just say amen. Cool. Awesome. I'm so glad we're in agreement. So let's hear, let's hear from Jerry. Jerry, tell us a little of your story. We don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are different um, seasons. Um, I was saved in, in 1984, I think it was, 86. And um, so from then till today, there's been many uh, seasons. Um, the current season that I'm in, is after all those years, I'm in a place where I have to trust God to a degree and to a level that I've never, ever had to trust him before. And for me, that's a little bit uh, shocking, amazing. I'm like, after all these years of trusting you and getting to know you, I'm in a place now where it's almost... Um, uh, it's, I have to put an effort forth. I have to, like, turn myself around, you might say. Wait a minute, you're not trusting God in this. You're, you're, you need to, you need to just totally trust God. So what I'm learning right now is that I only have to do what I can do. So I have to practice in my life, self-control. And I know that sounds simple. If I keep myself under control to the, to the extent that I am able to, in other words, I can choose whether to respond to an attack, 
I can choose whether to respond to a verbal attack. I can choose whether to um, respond to um, an incident on the road, you know, road rage. I can choose all that. So I have, I have a choice, and I can have self-control. I can choose to eat this or not eat this. I can choose to um, have a good attitude or not have a good attitude. I can make those choices. But beyond what I actually can control, I have to trust God. And so at our last um, Accelerant Conference, Right at the end of the conference, God spoke to me clearly. He said, you've crossed over. You're on the other side. You're in the promised land. Clearly. And I knew that those words immediately brought a new freedom, a new um, sense of, I'm so glad that's all behind me now. What out, the other thing that that brought me was, okay, now I'm in the promised land. I'm, in, I'm walking now into that which you have promised me, that you have clearly laid out before me, that you showed me this is what's coming, and now you're there. I found myself immediately in the promised land, surrounded by giants, surrounded by the enemy, surrounded by the only choice that I had was to trust God, really, in everything, every decision, every situation. So I was, I was listening to, one morning, I was listening to um, a preacher, no, I was listening to um, an audio Bible, and they were in Deuteronomy, and I was just, I was listening, but I was like going around the kitchen, and in, in my house and cleaning up and putting things away. And the verses in Deuter- Deuteronomy at that particular day, it just stopped me in my tracks because God was speaking to his people in the book of Deuter- Deuteronomy, and he was saying, you are now in the promised land. This new land is not like the old land. And my hand is upon this land. And the life you knew doesn't exist anymore. It's a new life. And all he asks of his people were, follow me, obey me, walk in righteousness, walk in obedience, and walk in purity. So after I listened to that on on audio, I looked it up, and I rewrote how he was actually speaking that to me. So it was really not... It was almost word for word the way it was in Deuteronomy, but I just put myself in there in that section. And then when I reread it, um, I realized that this was him speaking to me about the crossing over and being in the promised land and and, um, how, you know, his hand is on this land. And, yeah, there are giants in the land. But when you're, when you're in the promise, when you're in the promised land, when you're walking in that which he has already told you would happen, sometimes all you have to hang on to are the words, but God, you promised. And that's, that's where I am. I'm in a place where, but God, you promised. And, and I know You didn't bring me across. You didn't bring me through. You didn't take me out of Egypt or whatever Egypt I was in. You didn't take me out of there just to drop me in the promised land, surrounded by giants, surrounded by the enemy. You know, when when the Israelites went into the promised land, God told them to purge the land and to, to take the land, to possess the land. You can't, you can't sit back and let God do it for you because he's not going to. Whatever he's promised us, we're going to have to do our part in order for that promise to take place. And if you think you're going to sit and let God do it all, 
you're going to sit and watch nothing happen. So you partner with God, and you realize that I only have to do what I can do, and he does the rest. And a lot of times, for me, it's a matter of I can speak, so I can say something, and then he does the rest. Or I can, I can uh, move this from here to here. Physically, I can do that. But God has to do the rest. And um, so that's where I'm at. Yeah. Let me, let me jump in there because you're laying this beautiful foundation scripturally uh, of what happened in Israel's history and compared to, you know, your promised land experience. Can you tell us kind of in like earth terms, what do, what do your giants look like? You know, because giants looked something to the Israelites. What, what did, when you stepped into your promised land, what was that? What, what, did, what did the giants look like? What did hell coming against you look like? Well, number one giant would be a critical spirit that I had to face or that I've had to face. And, and, and you personally or some, some no, other situations? It was, it was other, other people being critical. Okay. Um, when, they, when others tear down, when, when others speak negative things, in your life or over you or about you, um, when others are critical of, of, of the good, like if you're doing something good and you know it's good, but this is for the better and, and it's turned around and it's turned into a negative and it's turned into, um, uh, it's just a critical spirit. That was one of the giants. Um, uh, the, the other giant would be, um, disrespect, and the and the that one I don't see as clear because I don't demand respect. I'm not the kind of person that demands respect. I believe that I, I maybe I need to, but I don't want to. I I can't. Why would I? How can I force someone to respect me? I can't. So that's where kind of what I'm talking about when I I do what I I know I can do. So I, I hold my tongue at times, and I, and I hold my emotions at times. I don't, you know, get angry, and, 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 and you know, I'm keeping that under control because that uh, falls in the category of self-control. But when you're, when, you're, when you're being assaulted by critical spirits and you're being assaulted by disrespect and you're being assaulted by, um, you know, say, say you clean something, and, and it's, but it's not clean enough, you know, or you, you, you move something from here to there, but you really shouldn't have put it here. You know, it should have been put over here or not moved at all, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's some of the giants um, in this new land. Um, and then there's, there's, the, there's the, the negative undercurrent that, uh, that uh, I, don't hear, I don't hear the negative undercurrent. I see the results. I hear the results of the negative undercurrent. So what, whatever that negative stuff is that's, that's going on, I don't, I don't hear that, but I see the results of that. Wow. So uh, I know we talked a little bit about, would you, would you say the promised land season started when you got uh, your new garage? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was trying to, I was hoping to lead him kind of in that zone because I, I was so excited for Jerry. Uh, we sat down probably two or three years ago and, and I asked Jerry, I said, like, what's your dream? You know, what do you, what do you, what do you just want to do? If you, had, if you could choose anything to do, what would you want to do? And he said, you know, I really want to own an auto mechanic garage. I just, I want to, I want to repair cars. And, uh, and so here we are a few years later, and seeing that dream come to fruition has just been awesome. Walking, seeing you walk into that, into that promised land experience and, and hanging on that promise of God. And just believing that that was that was going to come forth, so it's just it's been so exciting to see that. Right, and some and there are just times where that's what I that seems like the only thing I have to hold on to. It all started with a dream, um, and I don't know how many years ago it was, but I had this dream, and I was standing in this garage, in my dream, huh. talking to the former owner, and then in my dream I remember saying he was working on in this dream he was working on a uh, RV motorhome, which he does not have. He doesn't have one now. 
But in my dream, he was working on it. And my question to him that day was, what are you doing here? And that was the end of the dream. But now that I look back, it was the, that was you know him going into retirement and, and moving on. Wow. And for me to be in that place, um, that's how I just knew. Wow. And, uh, and I'm in there, and it's going well. Um, we're, we're operating in the black. <laughs> so, awesome. so that's good, yeah. yeah. But there, there are days where, you know, just stuff, you get blindsided. You know, like, where did that come from? Well, I know where that comes from. Because God's glad, the devil's mad, and I'm caught in the middle. I like, I like that phrase, there are days. How many of you have days? Yeah, okay. Sometimes my wife and I like to joke. There's this old line from, from, uh, from Modern Family, I think, um, that this, this woman, comes, this woman comes, in, comes in and says, hold on a second, sugar. Mama's had a day. And so every so often, every, every so often, we'll use that line when one of us is just not a good spot. Be like, hold on a minute. We've, I've had a day. You know, Mama's had a day. So, um, oh, yeah, where's your garage at? This isn't a shameless plug because we're not doing shame today. So this, we'll just call it a plug. Where is your garage at, Jer? I bought... Uh, I bought Paul Bennett's garage. It's in Elmira on uh, Industrial Park Boulevard, which is, if you're familiar with the city of Elmira, there is an animal shelter. It's the Elmira Animal Shelter, and we're right across from that. So we get to hear dogs barking all day long. And um, <laughs> even in the winter when all the doors are closed, it's a well-established business. been there for 40 years. Um, and uh, it's going to be more well-established. Yeah. Woo! Awesome. So, uh, Jerry was sharing uh, an important point, cause he, and he, he glossed past it because he's getting to the meat of, of his story, but he, said, he talked about he's lived seasons. There, there are different seasons. We know that there's different seasons of life. You know, being, being single is a season of life. Being a, uh, a young married is a season of life. Being, you know, moving into retirement is a season of life. All these different, all these different types of things. And so um, we're going to hear from somebody who's in a different, completely different season of life right now. So, Steph, tell us. Uh, and I know you've got your journal with you, so I know you've already come with thoughts prepared because that's just who you are. But uh, tell us a little bit about what season you're in and just, you know, what, uh, what you came in terms of story today. Uh, I also get to listen to barking dogs all day. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, yeah, so I grew up in Jesus. Um, and I attended uh, Baptist school for a short period uh, when I was younger. And something I appreciate about them is just their incredible power that they place on their testimonies and you know I always remember hearing like these insane testimonies that just like wreck your life and you're like wow and I always kind of thought like oh I don't really have that like you know I just I knew Jesus um, from the beginning and but I really am so blessed and fortunate to have grown up in that culture of kingdom um, but I had yet to realize really what letting him change your life actually looks like. Um, you know, I was just kind of sitting in that place, like, oh, yeah, me and Jesus, we're friends. Um, but it was probably uh, four or five years ago uh, that we had the tent revivals over at the fairground. Um, and I started coming to those with my friend. And that's really where God touched me and said, hey, I want relationship. Like, I want... Um, I want to be that thing for you. I want to be that place for you that's above everything else. And that's really that point in my life where I stepped over that line of surrender and submission and, like, gave it to him um, and just entered a new place of, like, knowing him as, like, my father, knowing him as Lord. And the very first thing he did was uh, point out five people in my life that I needed to ask for forgiveness. And they were, so they were either people that I had hurt or people that had hurt me and I had not responded appropriately. Um, 
I do not like conflict. I will happily spend the rest of my vo life avoiding conflict and hiding from any situation that requires um, being vulnerable and risk. So it's been interesting that we've been kind of processing through that the last couple of weeks. Um, but he really gave me a strength, and I think I was just at this point where I was willing to do anything because like, I, I had tasted it, and I, I wanted that, and I knew that I couldn't walk forward without stepping into that freedom. And so within that week, um, you know, I reached out or met with, like, each of those five people. And um, I remember in that time, I thought that it was about the forgiveness issue, which it definitely was. Unforgiveness is ugly and really can um, just hold you in such bondage. But now, looking back, I also realized that that was his first step in um, conquering fear within me. Um, and I, in my struggle for, um, to try and be perfect, um, and just my, yeah, really fear was the root of, and even in part still is, of the thing that I'm learning to really surrender and give to him. Um, and so it's been a journey since then. Um, and he continually provides me with opportunities to stretch and grow and learn in that. Um, but it's really just exciting coming into this place of learning what it really means to trust him and surrender to him and um, be a part of his body, like wholly and completely and vulnerably and building connection. That's awesome. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of something I th actually think I saw on a social media post uh, a few months back uh, about not making the mistake to judge your behind the scenes against somebody else's highlight reel. And, and it's really easy in our Facebook society to, to look at the selfies of somebody on vacation uh, or, you know, out to dinner uh, or enjoying any number of things about life and, and thinking that's their, that's their normal, that's their every day, and so things are just always roses for them. And, and meanwhile, your behind the scenes is life sucks. You know, this is terrible, my kid. Like, we just, you know, you, you, if you don't know our story, like Alden and I over the last month or so, um, you don't know, you know, sleep regression is a real thing. You know, and toddlers, you know, toddlers, toddlers can hit a spot where they're sleeping great over a couple weeks, and then all of a sudden, they're climbing out of their crib, you know, every single night and won't go back to bed. And so, in, in walking through, like, screaming, screaming child, you know, in the middle of the night, you don't see that in a Facebook world where you see the selfies and you see everything going well for somebody else. And... Um, and so I've just loved seeing the, um, are you guys just blessed by the snapshots that you're seeing of people's stories uh, in this context? Well, um, I'm going to share a little bit of mine because our sermon series planning team told me I had to. And, uh, and so um, I'm going to kind of rewind us a little bit. Um, several years ago, and by several now, oh my gosh, we're close to 11 years ago. Man, alive, it's been a while. Um, when Christ found me, I had spent a year getting witness to, actually by most of uh, uh, some of my upperclassmen students when I was teaching at Horsets High School, and they just would rail me with, you know, Sean, you just, you're overthinking things. You just, you got it, you got, you're just overthinking, and you think you've got to have it all together, and then you can come to Jesus, um, which is laughable in, in and of itself, but um, what what did it for me in terms of the turning point, I can really relate to Steph's story in terms of, um, you know, having grown up in a church environment that was fairly traditional uh, and knowing a whole lot about God and even doing ministry within a, within a church setting, but not actually ever knowing him. I, I, remember, I remember thinking that, and you've, some of you have heard me say this before, my, my one phrase was, if this is real, then I feel like people should be more excited about it. 
Like you, you, you hear that like Christ did all these things, you know, all these exploits, and he died for us so that we can actually go to heaven. At that point, I thought it was all about going to heaven. Did you know it's not all about going to heaven? Um, and, and I thought, if that's true, I feel like people should be more excited. That's the only conclusion I really drew from my faith walk as a, as a young person. And so years later, uh, I'm, I'm finishing my, my third year of, of uh, public school teaching, and uh, um, a really good friend sat me down to and made me watch Passion of the Christ. And they were really concerned for me after the film because I was dead silent for about 30 minutes. Uh, because the reality of what Christ did on, did on the cross pierced my soul, just absolutely tore me up on the inside, recognizing that as the flesh was being torn from his body, it was my sin condition that was doing that, that was wreaking that havoc on him. And so... I was changed. I mean, from that spot, I knew I couldn't go back to a traditional setting. I had to find a place where it was real. Uh, you know, I, I soon found a couple Bibles, but please hear me. In the context of all this, while I'm getting discipled, my life goes to crap. I mean, utter crap. You think, you, you think like, oh, I got Jesus now. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I, was, hmm, I was gracefully let go from my position. They were graceful about it. I was in disgrace. I was in disgrace with colleagues. I was in disgrace with friends. I was in disgrace with former students. Um, when I, and I just, I spent a year, I spent probably my first year as a born again Christian in tears, just absolute tears. And not just because of things I was losing, but because of what he was, what he was reshifting in me. Uh, some of you will, some of you will relate to this. Like maybe some of you had like, you know, Dave King will talk about, he had a Damascus road experience where the Lord just encountered him and it was like, it was all over. I had a shifting experience, but he took a good year to just reframe and reshape everything inside of me on all kinds of mindsets, all kinds of things, all kinds of arrogance and pride that I lived with most of my life, need for recognition. And I spent most of that first year in tears. I would, and I would show up to everything in the church, not because I had to or felt obligated to. I just needed to, like, I felt I need to constantly be in a spot where, like, how many different ways can I, can I grow in this thing? I showed up to, please hear me. If you know me, this is huge. I showed up to a 6 a.m. men's prayer breakfast. I mean, like, you got to understand, homeboy don't get up at 6 a.m. for anything. But, like, I showed up because, like, I was, I just, I needed I needed what he was giving me. I, like, I needed more, and I needed, and I knew he, like, I knew he wasn't going to be done anytime soon. And he kept reshaping and reforming and, and clarifying. Like, Jerusha, I can't believe you're here this morning, because, like, I remember your dad being at one of those breakfasts and praying for me one morning. Um, and it was, it, was this, it was this process upon process upon process of him uh, just redeeming and restoring. But meanwhile, my, my career is in shambles. Like I was, I was on an uphill scale to, to guest conduct at the national and international level. So you got, you got to understand, I mean, like I got nothing at this point. I applied for nine different teaching positions that fall alone. I got eight, I got job offers at eight of those positions and the Lord would not let me leave this place. They were all over the state or all over the region and he would not let me leave. There was just something that was saying, no, you've got a root right here. And I remember hearing the first time I ever heard the voice of the Lord, I was sitting about where Manly's sitting right now at the end of a service. Pastor Scott was leaving the, the, the platform, and I heard God say, this is home. And I've rested on that word so long now. I mean, like, you're... you're you're, you're not seeing a person who just, who leads worship and, you know, preaches on a platform or that kind of thing. You're seeing like an absolute transformed life. Like when we sing songs like, um, there won't be a day that you're not by my side. It's, you know, it's, you know, um, look how far we've come. It like, like that stuff wrecks me because it's like, it's, you, you, you guys know this. It's like, look how far we've come. Like, do you ever look, do you ever turn around and look back at how far Jesus has taken you? Like, some of you got to do that today, because I think sometimes we get so down on ourselves man, that, that we forget where we were. And we forget that, like, you feel like you're in a mess now, but, like, you were in a mess there, and he found you, and he saw you, and he said, we can do this together. And from the moment you said, Holy Spirit, come enter at my heart, like, you've never been alone. You've never been alone. 
Like, I have a love-hate relationship with that Footprints poem that everybody puts on, on greeting cards. No, really, because, it, because, because it's like, when, you know, well, no, when you only saw two footsteps, that's when I was carrying you. No, it's, it's, like, it's like, it's so cheesy, but like, it's so right. Because, no, because he legitimately, and here's the thing, like, I don't, I don't, I, th- I think a lot of that time is, like, sometimes, sometimes it's, like, the drag marks in the sand, it's not really so much, he's carrying us, we're like, I don't want to go anymore, I don't want to go anymore, you know, and he's dragging you along, but that's, but, like, you've never been alone, from the moment you said yes, you've never been alone, even in the days and times that you thought you were, you've never been alone, and, and so I think it's, you know, I think there's something to be said for this thing of the power of vulnerability because I, I want to encourage you, don't judge your behind the scenes against somebody else's highlight reel. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't p- compare your life to what you're seeing on Instagram. Everybody that posts everything on Instagram, it's only good stuff. Ain't nobody going to you know, write a picture or, or post a picture of their kids screaming at the top of their lungs. It's just not going to happen. I actually, I, we were at Disney World earlier this year. I'm going to close up with this and then, and, then, uh, and then get Keisha back up here. Team, you can come. Or Aldi and, and Dave, come on up. We're going to sing this song again. Uh, we're at Disney World, and, uh, and one day, I, I probably passed by four or five different instances of amazing parenting. And in each of these instances, the child was just losing their mind. And the reason I say amazing parenting is because when, and and I'm speaking to parents for a moment here, when you're going through your most difficult times as a parent, and you kind of get embarrassed, (laughs) you kind of get embarrassed (laughs) because other people are seeing that your kids don't have it all together. I'm walking by these situations and I'm thinking, I'm seeing your finest moments because you're weathering the storm. You're weathering in public what you would never want someone to see. Because, come on, you when you're out, you want your kids to act perfect and you want them to have the manners and you want them to sit right and act right and say right and everybody to say, oh, you're so cute. You guys must be the most amazing parents on the earth. Let me encourage you today. You're the most amazing parents on the earth. Because you choose to weather the storms. And isn't that what, like, this journey is about? Isn't that what these seasons are about? Like, you know, you've got, you've got Jer enters, entering his promised land and fighting giants. You've got Mei Lin, who loses her husband. And, and she didn't share this part. She loses her husband, and she keeps going. She kept showing up. She kept showing up to community. She kept showing up in her secret place with the Lord. She kept showing up to the word. She kept showing up in her love for other people. Not a lot of people can say that they do that. And she's coming through a testimony season where she can say, I weathered that storm. There's not a lot, now listen, there's not a lot that life can throw at us harder than losing your spouse or losing a child. But if you can come through that, you can say, I did that. I can do anything. And you got somebody at the beginning of their young adult journey getting ready to buy a house, um, newly married, and, and just looking at, um, at a fierce future of discipling nations, changing cultures, and having, walk, and having had to walk through um, the difficulty of realizing the Lord's like, hey, if you're going to love me, I need you to love other people, and that means getting forgiveness. I don't encourage any of us today. Like, is that, is, that, is that where you're at? I'm just placing that in front of you. Is that where you're at? Are you in a spot where you're like, yeah, I got to reconcile some things. The Lord's really clear about that. He's like, we're good if you're good with them. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you as we, as we get ready to worship you again. To just take these stories, a phrase, a thought, a gesture, an idea, and let it pierce our hearts. Let the vulnerability of these moments bring about a healing and a recognition. What do I do next? How do I live tomorrow different because of what you've impressed on us this morning? In Jesus' name.